Good morning, Sister Sroptimist, esteemed speakers and guests. We come together this morning to celebrate International Women's Day and to shine a spotlight and celebrate the fantastic work and outstanding achievements of women in science. In particular, our women from our shores in science. Sroptimist International Northern Ireland are proud to be working in partnership with Queen's University Belfast and AFBI it is important for us all to raise awareness of the importance of STEM subjects and to highlight the amazing work that our female scientists are undertaking in the world of science and the work that is happening, which fulfills the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Highlight female leadership in science and the local, national and global impact of their work. I did some research on women in science and the importance of STEM subjects. Do you know that at GCSE, it is a level playing field, boys and girls both doing science. Chemistry at A level is equal, but then we see changes in other STEM subjects, biology, physics, engineering and maths and computers. For engineering and maths at university, it is very male dominant, but things are improving. For the first time in university, there is a dominant female representation in the world of medicine and veterinary science. On an interview for BBC, I was asked why this is the case and why are women not really as dominant in science? And I can only imagine it's a mixture of societal norms whereby women traditionally stayed at home or were encouraged in vocational training, caring retail, secretarial careers. This is also further compounded by more traditional stereotypical views of scientists and engineers and the projection of male scientists or their work equipment such as hammers, drills, etc. in engineering. But finally, there is a serious lack of the prominence of female scientists as role models in the media today. In today's world and in our world tomorrow, there's hope that girls from all over the world will be able to access education and STEM subjects. And there is a belief, and hopefully that belief will increase, that it is okay to be a wife, to be a mother, and to be a career woman all at the same time. So I took a look at some famous, famous female scientists and what they're famous for, and hopefully you will recognise a few names. So I looked at Jane Goodall and her work with chimpanzees, Jennifer Doudna and her work with genetic engineering. And the work that she's doing in terms of genetic engineering has the ability and the potential to wipe out some of our most devastating genetic diseases. Rosalind Franklin, her work with discovery of DNA and her work on x-rays. Marie Curie for her outstanding achievement and contribution to um, cancer care. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first female doctor to graduate in the US. And recently in science and very prominent scientific field, Tierra Gwynn a young prominent scientist graduated from MIT and who worked with NASA and I think Boeing and who is a rocket structural analyst engineer. Today we are going to hear from other amazing female scientists who are leaders in their field. I want to personally thank Teresa Nixon, a seroptimist and past president of Northern Ireland for her outstanding contribution to today and for the groundwork that she has done in organising this partnership event. I'm excited to hear from our speakers and look forward to being educated and inspired. Before I go, it would only be right for me to do a plug for Seroptimist International. Seroptimist International is a global organisation that works for the rights of women and girls to improve their lives. Our strapline is to educate, enable and empower. And we work as a consultative um, party with the UN to try and further the UN sustainable goals in the work that we do. If this is something that's of interest of you, if you really, really care about the lives of women and girls, get in touch with any of us after this event, look at our web page, or indeed just talk to us and we will tell you a little bit more. But without further delay, I want to wish you all a fantastic International Women's Day. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your contribution to improving the lives of women and girls. I'd like to now pass over to Elizabeth, who's going to coordinate the rest of the event. Thank you and enjoy. 
Thank you, Mel. And good morning, everybody. I would echo the welcome that Melanie has just given you all. And um, it's really great to have you with us this Saturday morning um, to really celebrate local women in leadership, especially in science. I'd also like to echo Melanie's thanks to Teresa and Nixon um, and Chiropodus International Northern Ireland in general for actually approaching us in AFB and Queen's to work with you to deliver this um, webinar. It's, we really welcome the opportunity to, uh, to, to um, work with you and showcase you know, what our great ladies across AFB and Queen's are doing in the fields of science. And indeed, I'm sure some of them could be on that named list that, that Melanie had in years to come. So if, if some of you maybe aren't so much aware of AFB, but you may be more aware of Queen's. So very, very briefly, Queen's University, of course, is a very large university in Northern Ireland, very successful. And they um, have a number of schools. And one in particular is around the School of Biological Sciences. And associated with that is the Institute of Global Food Security. So that very much focuses on food security, but has a strong agricultural, um, environmental and, and health agenda working to the School of Biological Sciences and even into medicine and pharmacy. And of course, science is becoming more and more disciplinary, multidisciplinary as the years go by. So the stretching their arms into computer science and engineering now as well. So huge opportunities um, within the School of Biological Sciences, IGFS and Queen's as a whole. And then with regards to AFBI, we are a non-departmental public body and which has Department of Agriculture as our main sponsor. As such, we're the main science provider um, to inform policy in, in DERA as well as innovation and, and uh, evidence for the strategies for the industry, etc. So I suppose the, uh, the coming together of AFBI and Queen's, especially IGFS and the School of Biological Sciences, is quite a natural fit. And indeed, just as in January there, we have signed memorandum of agreement to work strategically better going uh, forward into the future. So I suppose it's with that ethos as well that it's wonderful to have, you know, ladies from both Queen's and AFBI on this call and indeed many of us have worked with each other already so I hope this morning it is quite a relaxed conversation showcasing what they do, what their lives are about and, and how they're really pushing the boundaries in science to deliver on a lot of the UN sustainability goals and, and, and really improve the health of animals and the health of society as a whole. I myself am a, and I'm, I'm a graduate of Queen's um, back in the day, and I also did my PhD linked with Queen's. I then I had a spell in Alfby Hillsborough. So I, I've experienced both sides of, of the, the coin um, in my own career. And I'm now a director in Alfby. So I'm one of three science directors in Alfby. And as such, my remit actually spans, you know, from the farm at Hillsborough and all the research um, that goes on there to improve the productivity and the profitability for farmers, as well as improve the welfare of animals and reduce their environmental footprint, right through to the food quality and, and the food that's produced from those animals. And also then stretching out to the land and the land management and, and the crops and the grass and that's grown on the land right then on through to the economics of it all and, and the modelling of um, different systems. So my remit is quite large. Personally, I am a mother as well with, with two children. One of them is still in bed because she's a teenager and the other one is probably watching um, something somewhere in, in the living room. So hopefully I'll not get any inter interruptions, but that can happen. But as I say, this morning is a celebration of women in leadership across AFBI and Queen's and hopefully, you know, for all ladies out there. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of, of what um, our ladies are going to tell you, just a few housekeeping rules, if I may. Um, this webinar will be recorded. So just to note that and also, you know, it's important then that the webinar will be available later on through YouTube. So if you've got friends and family who you think might be interested in seeing it after the event, it will be recorded and available to watch on YouTube afterwards. Would really, really encourage you to ask questions. Um, I don't want to have to think of all the questions. So hopefully down the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A function. 
please use that and, and filter in those questions. What we'll do is after each speaker, we will ask them some questions. So as they're speaking, if there's a question comes into your head, please do um, note it down in the question and answers and, and I'll ask it to the participants. And indeed, you know, if you're able, I'll maybe actually ask you to, to ask it yourself. But if, you're, if you don't want to, that's perfectly fine. But please do um, bring forward those questions and, and we'll make this a, a nice conversational morning. Um, we just ask you to make sure you are on mute. Um, you, you're probably automatically on mute and we automatically can put you on video. But if we do ask you to bring forward a question, then um, you can unmute yourself. So I suppose um, with no further ado, and I do hope you've all got your coffee beside you. It is Saturday morning, your, your fresh bread and coffees, that, that hopefully on the plate there. I would now like to invite Louise Cosby to bring forward her presentation. So Louise is a professor, Louise Cosby, works in AFBI. And uh, you know, I do admire Louise's passion very much for her area of work. And Louise, you know, nothing's a bother to Louise. She gets on, she wants to encourage her own staff. She wants to bring forward new initiatives um, to help staff. And indeed, you know, if there's a conference anywhere in the world, Louise will be there. So over to you, Louise. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm just uh, trying to share my, my screen here and uh, I hope everybody can, can see that now. Um, I, uh, I, I just want to welcome everybody and thank you very much for sparing the time this Saturday morning to listen to us and thank you for Teresa and Naomi and the Seroptimus for, for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to talk to you this morning. Uh, people are interested in vaccines at the minute, so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our work on vaccines. Um, I kind of am in AFPI, but uh, I was in Queens for a long time, and I'm an emeritus honorary professor actually in the Wellcome Wilson Institute in the medical school in Queens, and I work quite closely with my colleague on the vaccine side, Professor Alton Parr there. Um, so I'm just first of all, the people have asked about careers this morning, uh, women in, in science. So I'm going to just briefly give you uh, my career and a little bit of family. I used to give this, um, a, this kind of talk to the post grads and postdocs at Queen's um, in balancing career and, and family, which I think is very important. Um, I started off obviously doing science and maths A levels. I then did a BSc honours in Queen's in microbiology and immunology and uh, actually before I actually finished I got, I got married um, and then <clears throat> I did also did my PhD in Queen's in, um, and actually on measles uh, so the, you'll know I have actually worked quite a lot across both human and veterinary viruses and some of them are in the same virus families together so that, that actually does make sense. Uh, at the end of my PhD I had baby number one. Um, I then did was a postdoctoral research fellow and in the School of Biological Sciences which um, Elizabeth was speaking about where the, the Global um, Institute is. Um, I then I did a short then assistant professor's post just for a few months in the James Baker Institute at Cornell University in the USA and um, because it was over the summer months and my husband uh, was a teacher I was able to bring him and um, children children with me. I, I had had my um, I'd actually had a, a second child I think by, by that stage also I think I've it's lower down, but it was at that stage. I then, um, after that, got uh, my lectureship in Queen's, and this was initially funded for three years by the Medical Research Council as what's called a new blood lectureship. And then the university took that over after the, they funded that. I then went through the senior lecture stage where I had baby number three and then uh, became what a reader, which is actually recognised as your research and not just your, your teaching. And then I got the chair of microbiology in the medical school. Um, so was responsible for delivery of microbiology and related teaching to medical students. I still kept on teaching science students through the School of Biological Sciences and biomed students as well. 
Um, I also um, at that time then got my fellowship with the Royal College of Pathologists, speciality in virology, and I did that by publication. You can do it by exam or publication. And then I took a, a different step in my career. I decided the, the post of head of virology at AFBI came up and I applied for that. And that has arrived me, although I've dropped most of my teaching at Queen's um, to take on a new managerial role, but still keep the research running through. And that's given a lot of opportunities. And as I say, I still retain the, the foothold in Queen's as Emeritus Honorary Professor. So um, just to say a little bit about the virology branch, um, it's, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but we've, we've both uh, diagnostic labs uh, where we do work for the department for DERA, the Department of Agriculture, and then uh, we have research labs as well. And I have amazing staff who had these labs up and the staff that uh, work in them. So I, you know, I'd like to pay tribute to them this morning. And also the, the Virus Molecular Diagnostics Lab has actually split itself in two this year and been COVID testing um, for the hospitals along with other staff in AFBI. And a lot of our research and other unit staff have, have, have gone in and have been COVID testing too. So a major effort. And um, the just to home in then on the area, uh, which is my own kind of research interest at, at the minute is uh, bovine respiratory disease. And this is um, this is a very economically important disease for the agri food industry. Uh, it, a lot of animals become ill and uh, with this disease from one month to two years of age. So we're, do, we're approaching this on two fronts. We're trying to identify genetic markers of resistance to the virus, which will then maybe help breeding programs in the future. And then what I'm gonna finish talking about today is the production of more efficacious, more, more vaccines, which, which are, are proved to be better than current ones um, on the market or, or ones which they don't exist at all. So both, both approaches we hope also will reduce um, secondary bacterial infections and um, antimicrobial resistance. So the approach we're taking, myself and my colleagues in, um, other colleagues in Queens, is to use what's called a vectored, virus vectored vaccines. And we're making both live vaccines, which can and replicate the virus continues to replicate. And we're making other ones which are kind of a considered maybe safer um, situation where they're non they're infectious, they can get into cells, but then they don't continue replicating. And we're using this approach for bovine respiratory disease and also another disease not found in Northern Ireland, it's found in Southeast Asia, and it's an infection, Nipah virus of pigs and humans. Um, so the, the vaccine we're making there may have, um, might possibly be of use in humans as well. And in this approach, we take a safe virus that we know is safe for humans or animals. And we take a gene out of the virus that we want to make the vaccine against. And we put that in the genetic material of the safe virus. And we're able to then make this recombinant virus, um, which will deliver the information into the cell to make um, the protein that, that we're interested or proteins that we're interested in to make the vaccine. And you may be familiar with this and um, thought people would be interested this morning. This is the same approach, approach used in the, in the COVID-19 Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine. So in that case, they use a chimpanzee adenovirus. Um, they modify it by, by making it safe, uh, by actually knocking out a, a gene to make it safe. And then what on the other side of the uh, diagram here, you'll see the SARS virus itself. This is the COVID-19 virus, SARS uh, coronavirus 2. And the spike protein on the surface of that, um, we, they actually take the genetic material that, that codes, gives the genetic code to make that uh, spike protein. That is then put into the 
adenovirus backbone. And this adenovirus is actually a chimpanzee adenovirus and it's safe, it doesn't cause disease in humans. And then that is make sure your, your vaccine and that is delivered into um, humans and, um, and that gives them protection if they see the real virus. Um, if you just saying the, the other vaccine is the Pfizer vaccine, it's made in a different way, just to give you that information. It's a nanoparticle with the same genetic information is put into the particle, um, but it's a lipid nanoparticle, which then takes that um, information into, into the cell. Now, how does that relate to our own work? And this is really my last slide to uh, then tell you a little bit. So um, we're, we're actually making um, these vaccines, as I said, that we're making these to several different viruses which are in, involved in this bovine respiratory disease, one called bovine respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and we're using, instead of a chimpanzee adenovirus, we're using a virus called Sendai virus, which is uh, it's named after uh, Sendai in Japan, where it's first discovered. And it's a mouse virus and it's safe for, for animals, um, other animals and for um, humans. And we're putting the genes out of um, the, the bovine respiratory syncytial virus in. Um, and we're doing that work in, these viruses are being made down in the lab um, Professor Alt, with Alt, Professor Alton Parr in Queens. And uh, that we're also using a second virus, which is a paroinfluenza 5, which is a dog virus. And a colleague, Prof Biao He in University of Georgia in the USA, he's made this um, vaccine. And we will be trialing these then in, in calves in in like, like human trials are carried out on the site um, in AFPI. Uh, we're also now making a, a third one, which is called Parainfluenza 3 vaccine, again, on the sendovirus system and also the, the Nipah virus. So uh, I think I've come to the end of my time and I'd like to thank you all very much for attention. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you uh, very much, Louise. Um, there we go. My, my screens are jumping about. Um, I, we don't have any questions, so folks, please do, you know, don't be afraid to ask a question. I, I promise not to bring you and ask them yourselves, so don't be afraid to type it in. But, you know, Louise, that is absolutely fascinating. You know, I think it's just unreal how we can look at and, and cut and paste, if you like, some of these gene sequences out of safe viruses into... Um, you know, solutions that will really save a lot. And I suppose if I go back as well, you know, it's not only the science that's important here, the, uh, the unintended consequence, which is quite positive, is the financial value of all of this. You know, we've been very successful as a Queen's AFB, uh, you know, partnership in producing some very, very successful vaccines in the past. And one in particular, you know, it's no overestimation to suggest that it, it absolutely saved the pig industry across the whole world, which was being ravaged by um, a, a virus, um, BCB2 virus. So, you know, it's this huge, huge impact fr from this work. And the, here's a couple of questions. Now, let me see. What happens when vaccine is passed as safe and effective? That's from Melanie. So when, whenever the vaccine is, is passed as safe and effective, what, what, what are the stages that it goes through for you know, actual commercial use? Yeah, well, the same as human vaccines, veterinary vaccines have to be passed by regulatory bodies as well. I mean, the, the early work, obviously, we, we were trialling it in animals and then, you know, in, in a safe situation on site, and then it has to go into the field to be tested. Um, the same as you do trials in a in a in a country, or uh, to see if it's actually working, not just in an experimental situation, but out in the the real world. 
and then it has to go through regulators, as you've probably heard about the COVID vaccine, um, who go through all the data and uh, look very carefully before it's 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 safe. And then it is um, obviously you have to get manufacturers on board and, and companies. And we are talking to companies at, at the minute um, about sure. vaccines. Um, and after that, then obviously, uh, commercially it, it can go out commercially when it, it's it's been passed and this process has actually been speeded up a lot obviously you've seen and it would have taken years but they got the COVID vaccine out in a year and we we'll hope this impacts on veterinary vaccines as well yeah be excellent okay we've got so IWD good morning very interesting talk Louise thank you this year's IWD D theme is choose to challenge what issues in your field of work do you feel needs challenged? I probably would be interested to hear all the speakers' views on that. Um, and that's from Arine Miskimmon. So just for yourself then, Louise, what, what do you consider as, you, what needs to be challenged in your area of work? And then we'll maybe move on to the next speaker. Uh, if you mean what are the challenges or, or what do we need to be challenged on? Uh, well, I suppose, what do you see as your biggest challenge in doing your job? Yeah, it, it, this is, it's a very intricate process, obviously. We're, we're using a lot of molecular tools. It takes a long time to get right. There are a lot of things go wrong along the way. Um, you know, even if you've been through the process a lot of times, uh, each virus and system is, is different. And we've got a lot of hardworking uh postdoctoral scientists and um, students in the lab all contribute into this effort in the lab um, at Queen's and I've joined PhD students across there. So getting the whole process and then getting the the, car, the trials in the animals, it, it's, it's really as complicated nearly as and probably as getting the human trials set up. Um, so th there are so many logistics to get through and having to be on top of that and then thinking about the commercialization side as well, going to meetings to to try and talk to to yeah. companies. And so it, it, it's a big job. Yeah, yeah. And indeed, you, you have to have lots of skills because you have to be the scientist as well as the business partner, as well as business savvy whenever you're talking to the, the big multiples. Okay, well, Louise, we need to move on. Thank you very, very much. There's a couple more questions, but if we have time at the end, we'll come back to these questions, if that's okay with folks. Thanks, thanks very much, Alice. Thanks, Louise. So our next speaker this morning is Professor Sharon Hughes. And uh, Sharon, again, we're working very closely with Sharon across the Athlete Queen's Alliance, and she's a real driver. You know, I really have a lot of respect um, uh, for Sharon's enthusiasm to drive so many applications and so much great work across Af and she really does think of Athia Queens as it's nearly one <laughs> working as one which which is really wonderful and so much welcome from our side so Sharon over to you thank you okay, thank you very much uh, one second so Just, just to double check, everyone can see that okay? Yeah, I assume so, silence is golden. So uh, it's absolutely great to be talking at this event. So I want to thank um, the organizers and also uh, all of you for joining. So many of you have joined uh, on a Saturday morning, which is great. Um, so my name is Sharon Hughes. Um, I'm a professor in animal science and microbiology in, in Queens. And this is our lovely uh, new building there in the background, which we moved into two years ago, but obviously we haven't been in it very much for the, for the past year. Um, uh, so let me, let me show you the beginning perhaps. So some of you might hear my accent. So I was, uh, born and bred in, in Wales, in, on the southwest coast, uh, in a place called Cardigan. Uh, obviously, I'm very biased. I think it's a very beautiful place, as is Northern Ireland, of course. And I've settled in here very well. 
Uh, but my beginnings were really very agricultural. So I guess it's no surprise that I work in this area. Um, you'll see one of my uh, family's vintage tractors at the top and myself drinking cider on it, as you do. And then at the bottom, you know, all my, the beginnings were all surrounded by different animals. And the picture there is when I got my first uh, donkey. So that's myself and my brother, and my dad in that particular picture. Um, so the, this is my journey, I guess, from that point onwards. So I did um, BSc in zoology in, in Bangor University in North Wales. And then I carried on to do a, a master's in parasitology in the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And after that, I went to do a PhD in microbial ecology in Manchester University. So just as I finished um, the PhD, that's when I, I got married um, and then uh, moved to Bath to do a postdoc position for two years, um, again in microbial ecology. And after that point, um, I then joined um, what was then IGA. So we were a BBSSC um, Institute based in Aberystwyth. Um, and we merged with Aberystwyth University after that point. So when I was there, I, I moved from junior scientist up to senior scientist and then lecturer to senior lecturer. So I was actually a, a junior scientist when I had uh, both of my girls who are now 14 and 12. And then I moved to Queen's University in nearly four years ago now, which is quite unbelievable as a reader initially and then moved on to Professor. Okay, so my, my interests, as, as Elizabeth said, you know, I, I don't see any boundaries between Queen's and AFB, and I, I see it very much as one entity. So all of my work is, is, is in general in collaboration with the, some wonderful colleagues in AFB. Um, and really, I, I work mainly on ruminants, but there's some work on poultry and pigs as well. So looking at product quality, production, environmental impact, antimicrobial resistance um, and animal health as well. Um, and really, I'll just focus on this, the, you know, what I do uh, mostly, and that's looking at this rumen microbiome. So most of you will be aware that ruminants, they have four compartments to their um, stomach. And the main one of importance for degrading plant material is actually this rumen. And that's because it houses a vast array of different microbes. It has bacteria, protozoa, fungi. And just to note these methanogens here, you see that their numbers are, are smaller generally than some of the other microbes, but they are actually responsible for the methane which, which ruminants burp out. So I guess, I guess I've been uh, a little obsessed with understanding this system really because it's so fundamental to how productive an animal is, how much methane they produce, etc. So a lot of the research that I do is actually uh, driven by these two graphs here. And that is the fact that the world population is growing. We are going to, we are set to double by 2050 to about nine or 10 billion people. Um, and also, you know, countries which previously wouldn't have consumed as much uh, ruminant product um, are now consuming more. So we have real, you know, this slide, whenever I show this slide, you can talk about this one for um, all day long because there are so many questions around all of this about um, whether we should be eating less meat. And I think there is an argument for that in the westernized world, but we have to be conscious also that um, countries that like Africa are just not getting enough and they're not getting enough of the 
uh, micronutrients required. Um, and the other driver for my work, as I mentioned, is the need to reduce environmental impact. Um, so you will all have seen ruminants in the new continuously um, due to the fact that they produce an awful lot of methane, which is a, a greenhouse gas. So we are also looking at both pro productivity and what we can actually do to reduce the environmental impact. Um, so some of the things that we're doing, and again, you know, this is this is all with my colleagues um, in AFB and also a lot of um, external funders. If you look at the side there, we we have a lot of funding uh, around this area, and we're we're looking at different products, I guess, um, and different management practices to see whether we can reduce environmental impact and. Um, hopefully improve ruminant production. Um, so microalgae at the top there, uh, they also are quite rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so we have a lot of studies ongoing using microalgae in ruminants because it's also another mechanism of getting more omega-3 um, into meat and milk, which is obviously beneficial for human health. Um, seaweeds as well is very topical at the minute. Some of the red seaweeds can actually reduce um, methane output by around 80%. So alongside um, many colleagues internally and in AFB, we're looking at the um, seaweeds across uh, this island to see whether we can have similar effects, I guess. And this compound here, 3NOP, is produced by DSM Novozymes. So it's about to be commercialized and it's probably the one that's closest to market at the minute in terms of its ability to reduce methane output. Um, so again, some of the recent data shows that this can reduce methane from about 30 um, to 80%. At the minute, you don't get gains, though, in production. It's not detrimental for, for production, but it, it doesn't improve it. And of course, putting these things in place will depend on the new agriculture bill um, and whether you know, the, the industry is going to be compensated, I guess, for, for reducing methane. Um, some of the others there, uh, crude protein in the diet, that is more to do with the amount of nitrogen which is lost to the environment and reducing that as well, because nitrogen, when it gets into soil, can be converted to nitrous oxide, which is actually a, a more potent greenhouse gas than methane. And lastly, at the bottom, use of multi-swords. There's increasing data um, at the minute showing that things like white clover, for example, can reduce methane output. I'm just keeping an eye on time. So very, very briefly as well, we also take advantage of this room and microbiome. So if you think about it, they mainly work together in symbiosis. So they have to in order to degrade the plant material. But there are times when they will compete together and, and actually most of our antimicrobials that we have available have, have come from microbes. Um, so I had this, I guess, blue sky idea about seven years ago um, that there were probably going to be lots of antimicrobials being produced in that room. And, and we, found, we found hundreds of them. And to cut a long story short, we're actually testing some of those now in a bovine mastitis trial. So I'm hoping that that data is good. So I don't do this alone. These are some of the countries here with PIs that I have published with, and it's absolutely important. You know, you don't solve global issues alone. You do it in collaboration. And probably most importantly is this support network here. Uh, my friends at the top there, uh, that was when we were celebrating um, getting the professorship, and uh, I hope I can see them in person very soon. 
and the the two corgis at the bottom there that kept me going through lockdown and you will see the picture of my husband one of the corgis at the corner and my two daughters so i think that that is me done thank you very much Thank you, Sharon, very much. Um, the benefits of technology. I've had a text message from Elizabeth to say her internet has dropped off. So um, uh, it's great um, that we can uh, multitask and that's one thing uh, females do very well. So she sent me a message to say her internet is down. So I'm stepping in on behalf of Elizabeth. So um, um, fabulous um, I, um, for me. Um, you can see the, the breadth and the depth of uh, your work. Um, a question just to start off from me, um, what really comes forward is a collaboration. Um, that was very key in that slide. So perhaps you could maybe, I mean, um, for I suppose people out there, I mean, um, funding is tight. And, um, you know, we all know that we've got to work very hard to, to get funding for, for our science. You, you can see in the various slides, you've worked with a number of partners over the years, particularly on areas of real interest. So maybe you just want to say a little bit about, you know, collaborating with others, because I think that's one of the key messages of today. Um, your experience of the highs and lows of collaboration uh, yeah. to make sure you get funding for your work. Yeah, so I guess very early on in my career, I realised, you know, you, the issues that we're dealing with are global. So having a network of people that you work with is critical. So, and, you know, this has just been built up really from meeting in conferences and it, it's based on trust, building trust amongst um, collaborators that you are a person that they, they, they want to work with. And also I, I took on a few roles like, um, so I'm the chair of the Rumen Microbial Genomics uh, Network, which is actually one of the networks for the GRA, so Gro Global Research Alliance in Methane Mitigation. Um, so that, that is global. We have membership from about 60 countries. Um, and the World Health Organization, we have uh, numerous partners on that table when we meet. Um, and that's also been a mechanism to collaborate a little bit uh, more with people across the world and also to get the messages to the World Health Organization, to the um, FSA, etc. So, you know, I've been really quite focused on that because and also not just from the perspective of getting the work done, but actually it's it's so much more fun to do it together. And the impact goes so much further, doesn't it? Um, it really does, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we've had a lot of fun in that process. <laughs> yeah. And it isn't, uh, I mean, it is about relationships, it's about impact. And there is so much excellence, um, not only within sort of um, AFI and Queens, but uh, scientists across the world. And if we are going to, to, to um, really uh, take seriously some of these challenges of the UN sustainability goals, uh, we've got to work together. You know, yeah. um, so I think, listen, thank you so much for your, your you. uh, presentation today. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, we wish you well with all um, with all your work. And um, I will see you again, you know, very soon. Yes. So thank you. Um, um, so to, now we're going to move uh, through to, to Lisa. Um, and Lisa, are you OK to come forward um, and um, present on your um, area of science? Hi Josephine, yes, thank um, you. I'm ready here. I'll attempt to slide my share my slides. Um, okay. Apologies. I'm hoping that's sharing now, is that right? Yes, that's us now. Um, um, Lisa, your, your uh, slides are on, ready to go. Thank Great, you. thanks very much. So thanks, Josephine, and thank you for the invitation to take part today. Um, 
I was really delighted. And um, when I told my 17 year old daughter what I was doing today, she actually said the word cool. So that's a real win for me. Um, I'm head of station at AFBI Cross Nacrevi and we are part of the Grassland and Plant Sciences branch in AFBI. And today I'm just going to take a sort of a brief journey through um, my journey into leadership in science and the contribution that the work I'm involved in makes to UN sustainability goals. Um, just have a quick look at the time course of sort of my career. Um, as a kid, I was always interested in plants, loved being out in the woods and the fields. And my first degree was in um, applied biology at Liverpool Polytechnic. And I focus on agronomy, ecology and soil science. And that sort of initial introduction to soil science definitely gave me uh, the impetus to go on to study soil science for a PhD at Aberdeen University in the plant and soil science department. And um, my focus was on nutrient cycling in forest ecosystems. So it was very much looking at um, how nitrogen cycles through the crop, which was a Sitka spruce crop and the soil. So again, plant and soil sort of together. Um, in 1992, I came over to Northern Ireland and started um, uh, a, a sort of series of postdoctoral research fellowships, uh, working on three or four different projects. Um, I've highlighted two there. The first one was looking at nitrite formation in grassland soils and its um, role as a pollutant in river water. And then it sort of uh, progressed through to looking at serial pathogen um, resistance to key fungicides. So again, very much focuses on plant and soil. Um, whilst I was doing those uh, postdocs, I got married and had my first baby, a boy. And then in 20, 2003, I um, was fortunate enough, enough to get a job at Afby Cross Nacrevi. I was actually seven months pregnant when I started this job and I was out in the, the, the wheat fields casting a lot of shade over some wheat plants um, when I first started there. Um, I was responsible for producing the cereal recommend, recommended list along with Ethel White at the time. I was then um, uh, in charge of the cereal section and then had seed testing under my belt as well as responsibility. And it was then really that I started um, generating funding for my own research projects and for the work that we do generally in Afby Cross And in 2019, I was fortunate enough to uh, be successful in getting the, the post of head of Cross Nacrevi. Um, in terms of Afby Cross McCreevy, we have 25 staff who are um, very specialist, hardworking, dedicated staff. And between us all, we manage 32 hectares of land. Um, we have statutory research and commercial trials in multiple plant species. We also host the official seed testing station for Northern Ireland, and we are very proud coordinators of the EU Horizon 2020 project in a bar. Um, our key focus is, is three main areas, really, um, seed testing, variety evaluation, and also soil crop interactions. And I just want to focus on these um, briefly and try and draw in how the work we do in these areas addresses the uh, UN sustainability goals, of which there are actually 17. And we do actually uh, tick boxes for several of these. So if we look first at seed testing, um, Linda Charles is the uh, head of the seed testing lab in Cross Nacrevi. And we carry out seed certification, germin germination and purity. And the end goal is to produce certified seed of known varieties with high germination, which is largely free of weed to ensure that the crops sown in Northern Ireland establish well and contribute to profitable and sustainable yields. So we're really sort of un underpinning the whole agricultural industry there in making sure that Northern Ireland has access to good seed, which is what it actually um, says on the tin, if you like. Um, the variety testing, we, we do two key types of variety testing. The first one is to determine our new varieties coming onto the market distinct from existing varieties. So we're contributing very much to, um, you know, the, the introduction of new varieties onto the market with improved genetics, improved performance. The next type of variety testing we do is actually to evaluate that performance, um, looking at yield, agronomy and quality. And um, really what we want to do as well is provide information which enables growers to choose varieties which are best suited to local conditions. So it's really testing varieties real time um, and, and seeing how they're adapting to our changing weather patterns and, and sort of selecting those that perform the best. And it's our expertise in variety testing which really led to our success um, in uh, uh, securing EU funding for um, Innovar. 
Um, this is a project which is basically focusing on next generation variety testing for improved cropping on European land. AFBI are coordinators and it's the team at Cross McCreevy that coordinate that. So I am uh, the coordinator of this project. So um, it's a different uh, challenge in terms of um, leadership because I'm leading 21 partners across 10 different countries. Um, the value of the project is just shy of 8 million euros and we're about 18 months in. And this project has really enabled us to sort of expand the remit of what we do. And we're really taking a lot more of those UN sustainability goals. Um, just to give you sort of a very, we're hoping to achieve in Innovar, um, we're integrating new science into variety testing processes such as genomics, phenomics and machine learning. And this is really expanding um, AFPI's sort of uh, knowledge and ability. And we're learning a lot during the process of this project. We want to identify sustain sustainability criteria to measure how new plant varieties cope with more variable conditions and perform under more sustainable crop management practices. So it's all about um, how do plants uh, perform with changing climate and also how do we uh, have a recommendation system that um, selects varieties that need fewer inputs. Um, and what we want to do is empower farmers with information um, on HPLR, which is high performance, low risk varieties, which means that, you know, depending on what their growing scenario is, they can select varieties for, for their use. And this the intention is that this will be a, a pan-European um, selection tool, potentially. Um, soil crop interactions. Um, this uh, sort of area is is, is is mainly funded by Adira e &I projects, although um, I have been looking for external funding um, in other funding streams. And currently uh, there's three projects which I uh, lead. The first one is um, looking at soil health and the uh, key output for that hopefully next year will be a soil health um, scorecard for Northern Ireland, um, which growers can use to uh, monitor their soil health and, and hopefully take steps to improve. Um, looking at crops and organic manures, so the interaction between organic manures and how crops perform. We produce an awful lot of um, slurry and manures in Northern Ireland and uh, we have a new sort of project starting looking at how crops and soil respond to 16 different types of manure and also looking at the microbiological aspect of that in terms of pathogen loading. Cover cropping, um, Paul Cotney, um, a PhD student I supervised, has just finished his PhD and going forward, cover cropping, I think, is going to be a very uh, important uh, uh, potential for Northern Ireland in terms of incorporating this into sort of rotations and for the landscape of Northern going out forward to protect the environment and protect the land. Um, I just want to touch on gender equality and education. Um, I do some lecturing for Queens on crops and um, we've definitely seen an increase in female students entering agricultural studies, which is really encouraging because agriculture has very much been a male dominated um, sort of discipline. So it's really nice to see, you know, more, more women coming into to this study area. At Cross Nacreevy, we have 10 out of 16 scientific staff are women. And we also have a female farm manager, Julie. We have all our farm staff are, are men, but you know, Julie's in charge. <laughs> so um, in terms of leadership, um, there's a lot of challenges. I've tried to focus on the positives here. I suppose that the, 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 the negatives could be, it can be a lonely place. You can make, have to make very difficult decisions, which can be unpopular. Um, and also there's a you know, huge responsibility, obviously. But um, I think, um, in terms of the, the, the real advantages, you know, you have a real opportunity to be involved in the strategic development of future work. Um, you can create opportunities for advancement for staff, um, create new posts by generating funding. Um, we're always facing new challenges and I think that's really, um, you know, what keeps it fresh, keeps it interesting um, and, and forging new collaborations. And I think, you know, previous speakers have spoken on, you know, how challenges and collaborations are really, you know, um, the exciting part of the work. Um, just leads me to say thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for your time. These are all the people who are currently working at Cross Creevy and we're all looking forward to a time when we can get together um, and have our end of harvest barbecue out in the sunshine. So thank you very much for listening and welcome any questions. Thank you, Lisa. I'm back online and um, good old teamwork between Josephine and myself. <laughs>
<laughs> was much appreciated there in the last interview. Lisa, your work is brilliant, you know, and you're so enthusiastic and we all really appreciate that. And I think what, what we've seen here is between Louise and Sharon, the very fundamental biology and, and, and science coming through to the more applied end and what you do. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really great harmony. And I know you're so enthusiastic about stretching out and leading those big international, you know, those European um, projects. Eve and I shared that in a previous war, in a previous life, but um, hats off to yourself for really taking that forward. It's a huge commitment and you're doing a great job in it. Thank you. Um, there's, there's one question, um, Lisa, here around, has Brexit recently affected your work? Um, it actually has. There's been a, you know, a direct practical um, impact in that um, previously for sowing our trials, you know, we, we rely on a lot of seed coming over from um, GB, we're part of a UK trialling network for a lot of species. So um, actually moving seed from GB to Northern Ireland has, has created a lot of different issues and steps. And it's been a massive learning process trying to navigate that. But we, we are there and um, with a lot of help from colleagues over over the water as well. But um, yeah, so those those are addi additional work to, to what we normally do. Um, also going forward, I sit on a lot of committees for nationalists and seeds and um, going forward, there's going to be a parallel system for nationalists for GB in Northern Ireland. So that's an impact in, in practice. They probably won't deviate, but um, just because of the uh, Brexit, that is the way it is, is been set up now. So. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, no, a few bumps in the road mm -hmm. at this moment in time and maybe a few bumps to come. But um, I think the main messages we're getting there, which is yeah. great. And yeah. The other question here is from Maureen. And, and folks, there's 80 of you out there. Sometimes I feel quite lonely whenever you're sitting at home, but there are 80 others of you out there um, all listening in. So one of those is Maureen McGuire, and she's just asked around the EU brought in the farm to fork strategy as a first step towards sustainable food and farming policy framework. If we're no longer in the EU, will this continue in the UK? Lisa, I'm happy to take that question if you wish. Yeah, okay, I'm happy for you to do that too. I suppose <laughs> that, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so basically, um, the, the UK have nearly mirrored, you know, some of that form to fork, farm to fork um, strategy, and indeed Northern Ireland is mirroring that again. So the UK talks about clean growth and Northern Ireland is talking very much about green growth at the minute. So it is all about trying to grow the economy, but in a very sustainable way and promoting environmental health and doing so. So yes, there's very much is that filter through um, across the various um, policies that, that we'll see coming through into the future. So look, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, You're welcome. We, we're, thank you and for all your excellent work and uh, that barbecue looks good so please do open, open invite, invite <laughs> whenever that happens we'll get um, an extra pig <laughs> indeed indeed um people coming. so next speaker then thank you is neve o'connell and neve professor neve o'connell neve and i have been around a few corners together <laughs> on bits and pieces and again I, you know, with knees, knees are very good at balancing life work and uh, she's got, she's ready to get running now any minute. And once upon a time, I just couldn't work out why Neve was so into running. And I was like, the only reason I see to run is if it's around a field after sheep or cows because they've broken out. So fair play to Neve for being so enthusiastic. But look, Neve, look forward to you telling us now about your scientific life as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. I remember that conversation <laughs> very well. Okay. Fingers crossed everybody can, can see my slides okay. Again, if, if there's silence, then, then I'll presume everything is okay. So I'd just like to start by, by thanking the organizers for, for asking me to speak today. I think this has been a fantastic event, um, very inspiring and, and really, really good to be part of actually. Um, so I, I work as Professor of Animal Behaviour and Welfare at, at Queen's. Um, previously worked for AFBE for, for quite a number of years, so um, very close connections um, between both organisations as I think ha has been highlighted. Um, my area of work is obviously with, with farm animal welfare, but 
as has come up in, in the discussions today in the presentations, no, no scientist is an island. We don't work alone. Uh, we work as part of teams. Uh, and I really wanted to start by highlighting and acknowledging the fantastic team of, of people that I work with very closely. Uh, you can see them pictured here, Mary Baxter, uh, Maeve Palmer and, and Ray Campbell. And collectively, we do quite applied research in animal health and welfare and behavior uh, across different species. So we work with, with pigs and with cattle and with poultry. Um, and I, I think it's, it's fair to say that our job is sometimes not glamorous. <laughs> this is, is how we spend quite a bit of our time. Um, and in fact, on Monday morning, uh, Mary and I will, will be on a, a farm uh, looking like this uh, taking animal welfare measures and behaviour measures. Um, so it's not glamorous, um, but it's something that I certainly still feel hugely privileged to do. So I have had an interest in animal behaviour and welfare from being a, a very young child. I'm not from an agricultural background, but spent a lot of my early childhood um, on a local farm and particularly interested in the chickens as my mother keeps reminding me coming back and telling her about their behavior and their, their facial expressions apparently. So obviously the, the, the seed was sown at a very young age for me in terms of what I was then going to go on to do. So to be able to, to work and do research to, to develop and improve housing and management systems for farm animals to me is is hugely rewarding and continually rewarding. And I just feel very lucky to be able to do it. And um, obviously farm animal welfare doesn't just matter to, to me, um, it matters to, to most of us. Um, and so the type of research we do is, is hopefully really important to, to most of us. And, and just to, again, to highlight um, the fact that whenever you ask people, if you ask consumers, you know, do you care about farm animal welfare? Um, invariably the answer is yes. So I've just put one slide here that's highlighted some relatively recent research from the, the European Union. Um, and you can see it's a very large survey. And when people are asked the question, how important is it to protect the welfare of farm animals? 94% uh, feel that it's somewhat or very important. So we do care. And these responses are repeated often when this, this type of question is asked. And I think that this, this concern is, is changing buying patterns to some extent. We see when we look at trends of, of sales of, of ethical produce, particularly that produce that relates to, to animal welfare, that we see an increasing trend in, in gravitation towards these types of products um, by consumers. The sort of things that um, I think consumers are most concerned about when we talk about farm animal welfare is issues relating to, to naturalness of life and, and behavioral freedom. Um, people are particularly concerned about systems which are perceived to be intensive. Um, for example, through use of cages or confinement even within houses or through, through limited space or resources to be able to perform um, natural behaviors. So people are, are certainly concerned, um, particularly about uh, systems, as I say, that are perceived to be intensive. And this is leading to, to quite large scale changes in, in our production systems now. And we can see them coming into the coming years as well. I think from my perspective as an animal welfare scientist, it's hugely important that if we make a change or bring about a change in our production systems, and, and that, that's not easy to do, that if we do this in, in the name of, of animal welfare, then it has to do exactly what it says on the tin in that it must lead to actual tangible improvements in the welfare of the animals on our farm. And sometimes something that can perhaps look aesthetically pleasing to us may not actually make biological sense to the animal. And so it's, it's, it's really important that we have the underpinning science there to make sure that any changes that are made actually do lead to those tangible improvements in, in animal welfare. The sort of research we, we do um, is, as I said before, it's, it's very applied. Almost all of our research is funded by uh, companies. Uh, so it's commercially funded by, by different agri-food companies and, and most of it is conducted on commercial farms. 
Um, and a lot of it deals with evaluating housing and, and management systems for, for different farm animals. Um, sometimes a company will come to us and they will say, look, we're doing um, such and such in relation to housing or, or management. We think it's better for the animal's welfare, but can you provide some independent research to tell us whether or not this is actually the case? Um, and, and other times companies will come to us and say, we'd like you to work with us to, to develop a new housing or, or management system. Um, and in that case, we'll often bring a third, that's the animals themselves. So if we're designing a new housing system, um, for example, we will often do uh, motivational tests with the animals to try to get an understanding of, of what they want in their environment. Because as I said, what they may want and what we think they may want are, are sometimes very different. Um, so this is a nice part of research where we get to do things like preference tests. And it might be a little difficult to see in the picture on the, on the bottom here. Um, this is with um, chickens, with, with broiler chickens, our meat chickens, where we were um, trying to find out their preferences for different types of, of perches uh, to use within their house. So we, we sort of generated a, a type of a perch playground to, to allow the animals to, to show us through their behavior what they most like to interact with. And once we find what their preference is, then we can work with, with companies to try to incorporate that within commercial systems. So it's important for us to try to understand the needs of the animals when we're trying to design new, new systems. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's equally important for us to try to understand the effects of these systems on animals' welfare. And, and that's challenging. Um, we want to understand whether or not animals are suffering and yet they, they can't tell us directly so, so we, we have to take a range of measures to try to indicate how the animals are feeling. So often we'll look at their behavior and we'll look at things like their stress hormones. And, and that picture on the top there is actually showing somebody taking some hair samples from a pig um, because we were measuring stress hormones in the hair that can give us an understanding of, of their lifetime welfare status. And um, so, so we're interested in understanding levels of suffering in our animals, but increasingly as well, um, Many companies are saying, look, it's a given that we want our system to minimize suffering. What we really want now is to understand if it's maximizing happiness and, and positive experience in the animals. Um, so that there's an increased focus now on, on trying to understand you know, the extent to which our, our, our farming systems are, 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 are promoting this positive um, subjective experience. So uh, some of our research is now focusing on, on indicators of, of happiness, if you like, in animals, of, of positive experience, things like play behavior. I've included a picture of, of sheep here, but actually a lot of our work in this area is, is with poultry, um, with, with chickens. Um, and so it's, it's a nice area to be in to, 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 to look for indicators of, of positive experience in our animals as well. Um, I, I was asked as, as part of this talk to uh, highlight how we are contributing to, to UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, which is a challenge because animal welfare isn't mentioned directly within the goals. Um, but certainly, if you look to the literature, you, you can see that there is a link between animal welfare and many of these goals. I think just, you know, probably the most obvious link is that if an animal is suffering or it's stressed, then it won't produce as well and um, it won't grow as well. Um, it's more likely to be immunosuppressed and therefore more likely to be sick. Um, in this case, um, poor animal welfare contributes to, to poverty and hunger um, uh, globally. But also if animals are, are sick more often, then this can lead to increased antibiotic usage and this can lead to, to problems with antibiotic resistance and therefore with health and, and well-being. So there are certainly general links between animal welfare and, and many of the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I thought I would just finish though by talking very briefly about the impact of, of some of your, our research on sustainability more generally. Um, because as I've said, um, for many people, animal welfare is, is, is a key component of sustainable animal production systems. Um, and so any research that we can do that leads to improved animal welfare within uh, livestock production is having an impact on, on sustainability. Uh, one of the areas where we've perhaps had had most of the impact is with our, our research into to broiler chickens. 
And um, so these are our meat chickens. So, and obviously meat is, our chicken is, is a hugely, one of, one of our most consumed meats. We produce about 100 million tons of, of chicken meat annually, uh, globally. We've done a lot of research over the past 10 years in trying to refine and develop housing systems for our, our broiler chickens. And we've, we've published quite a bit in this area. Some of the things we've looked at has been the, the importance of providing natural light to the birds um, and providing access to enrichment items like perches and dust baths and other types of enrichment to allow them to engage in, in natural behaviors that are really important to them. Um, the a lot of the research has been funded by Moy Park and, and all of it has been conducted on their farms, so on, on a commercial environment. Um, and the research has been used to, to underpin their production practice. So we've had a direct impact on, on production practice within Moy Park. But also as part of a, a university exercise more recently, we've been trying to, to map the, the more global impact of our research. Um, and we've, we've sought testimonials from, from different groups. And we found as part of that exercise that the research has helped underpin standards by the RSPCA in the UK and in Australia. Um, we have had testimonials from Compassion and World Farming and World Animal Protection to say that the, the research findings are helping to underpin standards um, more broadly in Europe and also in North America and in South America. Um, and perhaps one of the nicest pieces of feedback we got was from Red Tractor, which, which many of us would be familiar with here in the UK, which has indicated that our studies into to broiler chicken housing and things like the importance of natural light and environmental enrichment have informed their requirements and, and continue to influence the welfare of approximately a billion chickens produced in the UK each year under their scheme. So for us as well, for scientists, um, it, it's very rewarding to see that type of feedback and just to see that the level of the impact of our research on the lives of our farm animals. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Neve. And, and you know, fascinating as ever. I just I love your passion to get really into understand the animal and put the animal at the, the front and center of the question and, and make sure that. Um, it's happy and we're still in the producer. <laughs> but a um, couple of questions here. And thank you to Jackie and Miriam for your compliments. Um, you know, they're very much um, congratulating you all as speakers uh, for your passion and, and your excellence in, in your areas. So thank you, Jackie and Miriam, for those comments. Um, I think Catherine has a question here. As consumers, can you give us guidance on how we can purchase foods that come from producers that care for animal welfare? Well, I think there, there, are, there are legislative standards that, that cover everybody in terms of, of animal welfare as well. So there's a certain level of welfare that, that comes as part of our, our legislation. And um, there are certain schemes which would um, produce under higher welfare standards. Um, that, that you can also, I mean, they're, they're apparent with, within the retailers. So it's, I mean, for example, organic produce may involve, you know, more access to, to free range as well. So there, there, there are certain things that you can look for if, if you're trying to buy food that, that might indicate higher welfare standards. But, but certainly there's a certain level of welfare that, that's guaranteed under our legislation. And then certain retailers as well will, will add additional layers of, of welfare standards uh, to their supply chains. So it should be obvious on the packaging and packaging can be complicated, but it should be obvious. obvious. I, I think so. It, it, sometimes it can be confusing with labeling as well, but I think um, sometimes there, there certainly is, is an onus for, for consumers to, to perhaps yeah, take a little bit more time to see how the product has been produced and what mm -hmm what the underlying requirements are for, for the production of that particular product that you're buying. Yeah, yeah. And I think with welfare as well, it, it should be a given that, you know, good welfare is out there. As you said, it's bringing to, to the higher level of ensuring well-being for the animal. Mm -hmm. um, Neve, the other question here is going to be a little bit different, but you're well-placed to, to answer it. Um, it's around how to encourage young girls to study science subjects when under pressure to obtain high marks and A-levels or leaving cert. We both have teenagers just about to pick our GCSE yeah, subjects. So. <laughs> yes, um, I think that this has to start at an early age at school. And I, I'm, 
I'm hoping that the message is, is, is getting across at a very early age um, that, that no subject is off limits for, for female students. Certainly with, with my own daughter, we've been very much promoting uh, the, 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 the maths and the electronics. And, and I, I think there was often a, a conception among, among, a perception among females, you know, I, I, I'm not good at that, I can't do that. And, and there's absolutely no reason why you can't do that. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I, I feel that this, that this has to start at, at, at a very young age in school, in primary school age, to ensure that no messages are getting through to, to our female um, students that they can't do something or they're not best placed to do something because yeah. nothing should be off limits. And that's parents and teachers getting that message to try and encourage the, those younger people. And if you're asking like me, it is a challenge to, to try and get your teenage daughter <laughs> um, Neve has um, Maria and I have Katie and they're, they're very similar in age so we're going through the same challenge at the minute with GCSE selection we are <laughs> um, okay well look folks um, thank you very much Neve. really appreciate that and a uh, wonderful you know just to have you on, on the, the webinar this morning so over to Josephine now Josephine's our last speaker of the morning and Josephine probably take a little bit of a different tact um, but nonetheless, she has probably the hardest job of them all, trying to keep all of us scientists actually <laughs> in the right direction of travel when it comes to governance. Um, so over to you, Josephine, our Acting Chief Executive of AFI. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So um, thank you so much for the uh, invitation today. Um, I'm Josephine Kelly. Uh, I work at AFI. And for those, we were talking a lot about AFPI today, but AFPI is the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute. And I think um, it's one of the, the best kept secrets uh, around us uh, because you can see the work that goes on. I think a lot of people know a lot about Queens, but they haven't heard of the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute. Uh, and, um, you know, to me, when I joined AFPI, um, about three and a half years ago as the Director of Finance and Corporate Affairs. Um, I was just stunned by the science, the, the work that's going on and the impact. Now, I knew very quickly when I joined um, the importance of collaboration. And AFBI and Queen's have worked together for years and years. But um, we needed to come together um, as, a, I suppose, a collaborative uh, approach uh, to the funding and to put a bit of a framework around that. Um, so you, this today is part of the Queen's Alliance, the Queen's AFBI Alliance, uh, where we've brought together the excellence of, um, now we do have excellent male scientists as well as excellent female scientists, but bring um, the expertise uh, between those two organisations together for impact uh, and um, you know to bring our science that little bit further as two organisations together. So I suppose my first um, message today is about collaboration. And we've been absolutely delighted uh, to be asked along by the Shropters NI today. And thank you particularly to Joan Houston, who is going to wrap up after me. Um, Joan, I have known for many years, also a chartered accountant. Um, and uh, we have sort of, uh, uh, I suppose over the years, uh, been, uh, I have been aware of Joan and her career. And now we've had the, the, uh, the pleasure of working together, Joan on the AFBI board and myself then as, as part of the, the senior management team um, in AFBI. But the, today has been collaboration between Shiroptimus, AFBI and Queen's all coming together. And if we hadn't had those conversations uh, today, it mightn't have happened as it, as it has. So I think that's the first message to everybody listening. Um, everybody has a role to play, um, but if we play it together, we can go so much further. Um, and I think today, um, the questions about uh, females and leadership, females going into science, uh, the impact on the UN sustainability goals, unless we all work together, uh, you know, these are achievable and that has to be the message that goes out. And so for any sort of uh, people making, thinking about career choices, um, I think it's very much about playing to your skills but playing together uh, a teamwork. Teamwork is incredibly important and um, looking to see what impact you can have. 
Now, a little bit about myself before I, I, I go on about sort of uh, uh, interesting things about funding. Uh, I'm also married. I have two sons, so um, and they're definitely not um, following um, in my footsteps. But and again, we, we can only encourage. But I think it's really important that they find their own ways and use their skills to what um, what they want to do. Um, Neve, I also have four hens and I love my hens. And um, so I'm always very interested to hear what you have to say. So behind a lot of the science and the, and the leadership, there are human beings with families uh, working together um, and we all can have an impact on um, whether it's through primary schools, through our work, through the, the, the local community and are really showcasing science and the, and the work that's done here in Northern Ireland. So with the Alliance, um, at this point in time, we have 35 projects underway, uh, totaling a million pounds, but together, we can leverage 23 million pounds of uh, science funding. And I said before, I mean, uh, funding is tight and we have to come together to, um, to really demonstrate the impact of our science and you know, how we can, I suppose, use our skill sets together to go that bit further. Um, a little bit more about, I suppose, um, education. The Alliance, uh, we also have 40 PhD students uh, that work between ourselves, Queen's and AFBE. Um, so education, it's really important, I suppose, if people then have chosen the, the subjects at GCAC and A-level, that they go on that little bit further and into their research work. So we um, are really keen to, um, to provide opportunities for PhD students to have a real life experience, I suppose, of, of AFBE um, systems, um, AFBE processes and AFBE science. So I think my first message is about collaboration. The second is about science and impact. And I think over the last number of months, we've seen the real benefit of science and scientists. And this is the time I think to really celebrate the work of scientists because without scientists, we'd be all a lot slower returning to normal life after the impact of COVID. Um, so to all those scientists out there, I think we have a really big thank you on behalf of society for all the work that they, they do. And we as the Alliance have been delighted to help with the COVID-19 testing. Both uh, AFBE and Queen staff have been involved in that. And it's been fantastic that we've been able to play our part in the COVID testing that's been going over um, at the Stormont site um, and um, doing our bit uh, for um, the, the people here. And then one of the uh, questions coming forward was about challenge. And for me, challenge is really important. And if we're going to do things, um, we should do them well. And it's really important that we have proper systems and proper governance in place so that um, whatever we do in life with science, it goes that bit further. And it's renowned work that is on various, you know, really good systems. It's reported very well. And we also look at our, I suppose, how we put forward the impact of that science uh, through um, messages out to, um, to, to uh, in public life. Um, and that's today why this is again really important because scientists are doing tremendously good work, but we don't always do enough, I think, shouting about what happens. So. I think a little plug um, for the corporate comms teams of both Queen's and AFBE, uh, to Michael and to Richard, who've been working behind the scenes to make this work today. Um, they are making sure that everybody was uh, enrolled, um, that we were all um, able to access the systems as um, panelists and as yourselves as the audience today. So we all have a role to play and I'd really like to thank them for the work that they've done behind the scenes. And again, incredibly important. So finally, I think um, anybody listening, thank you for joining us this morning uh, and uh, listening to the, the real work of science. Um, we all have a role here on promoting science and the importance that um, you know, females um, play to their strengths. And there's nothing that you can't do. It's just a matter of choice. So um, if, if uh, females want to go into science, they should absolutely be encouraged to do so because they have the skills, they have the leadership, and I think today has shown that to be the case. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand over, um, I think it's to Joan, to wrap up. A final thank you to the Shroptimus NI for um, hosting this event and connecting us all together. So thank you again. And uh, Elizabeth and Joan, I'll hand over now.
Thank you very much, Josephine. And I suppose just with, with three minutes to go, I um, would invite Joan to, to the stage um, to give the final remarks. Thank you, Joan. As Thanks, Elizabeth. I try and make your time limit work. Um, the UN theme of International Women's Day this year was Women in Leadership Choose to Challenge. And I think you will agree that our speakers today have shown all that ability in spades and inspired us through their leadership and innovation in their chosen careers, which was a, which started in different places and has led to the high positions that they now hold. Southwest International, as an NGO to the United Nations, um, is committed to the aims of the sustainable goals. And our speakers today have all highlighted that their work links to those goals in some ways. Today, I think we've focused on goal 12, um, which is the sustainable consumption and production, which essentially encourages us, us to do more with less, decoupling economic growth from environmental degradation, increasing resource efficiency by promoting more sustainable lifestyles. The outcome of this contributes to the poverty alleviation, low carbon and green economies. And our speakers today all demonstrated how they're working in their specific fields to achieve those goals. The, the speakers have demonstrated also that they, like Soroptimus, are um, linked locally, nationally and internationally and have global reach. So it just leaves me to thank Elizabeth, Louise, Sharon, Lisa, Neve and Josephine for their outstanding talks and for the willingness with which they agreed when I proposed this um, initially to uh, take it up and work with Teresa. As a board member of AFPI, it has been a, priv a pr privilege to see the combined efforts these professors, doctors and chartered accountants of the two outstanding institutes of Queen's and AFB have been have, have developed working together in their strategic alliance. And that has all um, happened since I joined the board. And we know that there are great opportunities ahead for these organizations working together. But finally, this would not have happened without the work of Theresa Nixon collaborating on behalf of President Melanie and the Queen's and QUB teams. And as Elizabeth and, and Theresa have mentioned, we certainly couldn't have done it without the technical support of Richard McCormick and Michael Hills from Appian and Queen's. Uh, and without all you tuning in and joining us to celebrate International Women's Day today. Uh, finally, um, you can uh, uh, follow. Uh, you can follow us. Uh, follow this, or um, look at review this uh, uh, recording on the YouTube channel. And Michael will send all the delegates here today a link to the YouTube channel um, after this uh, meeting, and he will also tell you where, if you aren't registered, you can pass on the. Um, the search or who you, what you search for on YouTube to pick it up for those friends and families who you think might be interested in seeing this but couldn't be here this morning. So thank you very much everybody and I hope you have a lovely day and um, this has educated, empowered and enabled you to actually promote science with girls for the future. Thank you.